The Book of Revelation. The Apocalypse of St. John. A 2002 poll indicated that 59% of Americans believe the events predicted in the Book of Revelation would come to pass. The Brookings Institute recently released the results of their survey entitled American Attitudes Toward the Middle East and Israel, which discovered that 73% of America's 50 million evangelical Christians believe that world events would turn against Israel the closer we get to the end times. Additionally, 79% of evangelicals interpret the unfolding violence across the Middle East as a sign that the end times are near. Ultimately, it is the book of Revelation that serves as the blueprint for the great work of the occult secret societies. The author of Revelation, John the Evangelist, has therefore become a patron saint of Freemasonry. The book of Revelation, which was the result of the influence of Jewish apocalyptic literature, was the last book to have been accepted into the New Testament canon, and without, not without a lot of controversy. Its acceptance was the culmination of centuries of progress where the original simple teachings of Jesus were corrupted through the influence of Neoplatonism, Gnosticism, and the ancient mysteries, the most influential of which were the mysteries of Mithras. In fact, it was long rumored that the book was authored by a Gnostic named Serinthus, a fact recognized by Albert Pike. According to Pike in Morals and Dogma, described as the Bible of Freemasonry, the book of Revelation represents the hidden secrets of the Jewish Kabbalah. The Apocalypse, that sublime Kabbalistic and prophetic summary of all the occult figures, divides its images into three septenaries, after each of which there is silence in heaven. There are seven seals to be opened, that is to say, seven mysteries to know, and the seven difficulties to overcome, seven trumpets to sound, and seven cups to empty. The apocalypse is, to those who receive the 19th degree, the apotheosis of that sublime faith which aspires to God alone and despises all the pomps and works of Lucifer. Lucifer, the light bearer, strange and mysterious name to give to the spirit of darkness. Lucifer, the son of the morning, it is he who bears the light and with its splendors intolerable, blinds feeble, sensual, or selfish souls. Doubt it not, for traditions are full of divine revelations and inspirations. And inspiration is not of one age nor of one creed. Plato and Philo also were inspired. The Apocalypse, indeed, is a book as obscure as the Zohar. It is written hieroglyphically, hieroglyphically, with numbers and images, and the Apostle often appeals to the intelligence of the initiated. Let him who hath knowledge understand. Let him who understands calculate. He often says after an allegory or the mention of a number. St. John, the favorite apostle and the depository, depositary of all the secrets of the Savior, therefore did not write to be understood by the multitude. The book of Revelation occupies a central place in Christian es eschatology and is the only apocalyptic document in the New Testament. Its influence has been exercised in de the development of Christian millennialism. From millennium, Latin for thousand years, or kiliasm in Greek, a belief held by some Christian denominations that there will be a golden age or paradise on earth, in which Christ will reign for a thousand years prior to the final judgment and future eternal state the world to come, or the new heaven and new earth. The book of Revelation begins with John on the island of Patmos in the Aegean, addressing a letter to the seven churches of Asia. John describes the opening of the seven seals and the servants of God who number 144,000 or 12,000 from each of the tribes of Israel. John tells that there was a war in heaven, as Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. 
The result of the conflict was that the dragon was cast out of heaven and one third of the angels were cast out with him and are now trying to accomplish his purpose by working through the Roman emperor. He then describes a series of prophetic visions, including figures such as the whore of Babylon and the uses of imagery of the book of Daniel, of a beast that has seven heads and ten horns, who forces all people to bear the mark of the beast, 666. <clears throat> After the destruction of the beast by the second coming of Jesus, the promised kingdom is set up in which Jesus and the saints will rule for a thousand years and the righteous will reign in the city of God. Sorry. Which is the new Jerusalem. Satan is again released and goes out to deceive the nations, specifically Gog and Magog, and instigates a final battle against God and his saints in Revelation 20, 1 through 6. Satan and his armies are defeated and cast into the lake of fire, an event which is known as the second death, also Gehenna. That's one of my favorite black metal bands, Gehenna. This is an image of um, The Last Judgment by Stefan Lochner from 1435. <clears throat> Good. Try not to clear my throat too much here. During the Babylonian exile, the prophet Ezekiel foretold the reconstruction of the Jerusalem temple. Ezekiel then predicts the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple because of the abominations being practiced there, and closes with the promise of a new beginning and a new temple. Ezekiel saw a supernatural human figure who would serve as its architect, who showed him in detail the design measurements and ornamenta ornamentation. The book finally envisions the permanent entrance of the God of Israel through the eastern gate of the third temple wall. When the Babylonian exile ended in 538 BC, great messianic hopes were placed on the revival of Israel's sacred mission and the second temple of Jerusalem became the embodiment of its aspirations. Central to the expectations of the book of Revelation is the rebuilding of what has been called the Temple of Jerusalem, being the third construction of the original Temple of Solomon. Since the destruction of the first Temple of Jerusalem by the Babylonians in 586 BC and the second Temple by the Romans in 70 AD, religious Jews and their Christian Zionist sympathizers have expressed their desire to see the building of a third Temple on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. The site's significance stems in part from religious traditions regarding the rock known as the foundation stone at its heart, which bears great significance for Jews and Muslims as the site of Abraham's attempted sacrifice of his son. According to some Islamic scholars, the rock is also from where the Islamic prophet Muhammad ascended to heaven accompanied by the angel Gabriel. While holding significance to the three of the world's great faiths, the rebuilding of the Temple of Solomon is also at the core of the symbolism of Freemasonry, serving as an allegory for the Order's plans, defined as the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Book of Revelation, also known as the Great Work, as indicated by Albert Pike, whereas King Solomon was said to have used demonic entities to assist him in the construction of his temple, i.e. witchcraft, so masonry uses the analogy of building or masonry, which is referred to as the craft, and is a reference to the use of magic for bringing about the creation of a new world order. Temple of Herod. This image is the reconstructed second temple of Jerusalem, further refurbished by Herod the Great. The creatures of the vision of Ezekiel and the book of Revelation are also paralleled in the lion-headed figure of the most popular cult of the Roman Empire, the Mysteries of Mithras, which held numerous beliefs in common with Neoplatonism, Gnosticism, and Hermeticism, 
and ultimately influenced the formation of Catholic Christianity. It was through the House of Herod, intermarriage with the dynasty of the Julio-Claudian Roman emperors, the House of Comagene, as well as with the priest kings of Emesa, which produced the descendants who developed and spread the cult of Mithraism to the Roman world and contributed its adaptation to Catholic Christianity. Herod, also known as Herod the Great and Herod I, was a Roman client of Judea, referred to as the Herodian Kingdom. Herod arose from a wealthy, influential Idumean family. The Idumeans were successors to the Edomites, who had settled in Edom in southern Judea, but between 130 to 140 BC were required to convert to Judaism. According to contemporary historians, Herod the Great is perhaps the only figure in ancient Jewish history who has been loathed equally by Jewish and Christian posterity. Depicted both from Jews and Christians as a tyrant and bloodthirsty ruler, he is known for his colossal building projects throughout Judea, including his re renovation of the Second Temple in Jerusalem and the expansion of the Temple Mount towards its north, the construction of the port at Caesarea Maritima, the fortress at Masada, and Herodium. The Second Temple was originally a rather modest structure constructed by a number of Jewish exile groups returning from Babylon, but it was during Herod's reign that it was completely refurbished, and the original structure was totally overhauled into the large and magnificent edifices and facades that are more recognizable to history. Despite the fact that the destruction of the first temple was to have been in punishment for the corruption of Judaism by pagan themes, such beliefs nevertheless persisted. Many Jews believe that the fertility of the land and its people, as well as the harmony of, of the universe itself, was dependent upon the ritual of the revived temple. Erwin Goodenough argues that by the time King Herod the Great proposed the reconstruction of the temple in 20 BC, the great temple cultus had become for many Jews an allegory of a Jewish mystery religion. Josephus claimed that while Herod was preoccupied with rebuilding the, temple, the Jerusalem temple, he favored the related sect of the Pythagorean Essenes. Josephus related that they were regarded by King Herod as being endowed with higher powers. Herod's favor upon them was due to the fact that one of their members named Menahem, Menahem who possessed the gift of prophecy, had predicted Herod's rise to royalty. As reported by historian Marcia Keith Sushard, who traced the influence of the temple cult on Freemasonry during Herod's reconstruction, only priests who had skills as masons were allowed to work in the inner sanctuary, the Holy of Holies, where even Herod himself was not allowed to enter. The Holy of Holies guarded the erotic secret of the cherubim wrapped in sexual embrace, mirroring the dying God tradition of the sacred marriage. When Israel fulfilled God's will, the faces of the cherubim were turned towards each other. But when Israel sinned, they were turned away from each other. On the Feast of Booths, or Sukkoth, a great fertility ritual, the pilgrims were allowed to glimpse at the cherubim in the Holy of Holies, and then to indulge in an orgiastic outburst of sexual license. Uh, that's the uh, festival that the Greek philosophers in the last episode were saying were like Dionysian rituals, so that's why they were saying the Jewish god was Dionysus. Continuing. The, uh, the ostensibly monotheistic Jews were exposed to humiliation when the overtly pagan statuary was discovered by Antiochus, the Syrian king, when he sacked the temple in 168 BC. Here's an image of the cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. And my uh, Torah portion during my uh, bar mitzvah was the description of like the measurements and the decorations of the Ark of the Covenant. That's pretty cool. Continuing. 
The ancient Jewish historian Flavius Josephus records that Herod completely rebuilt the temple, which therefore became known as Herod's Temple. He also recounts how only Jewish artisans were allowed to work on the temple, and the esoteric symbolism of the architecture was considered so sacred that only priest masons were allowed to work on the inner sanctuary. And according to Josephus, over a thousand priests were trained as stonemasons and craftsmen. Though Herod recruited the Jewish builders of Palestine, he also relied especially on the Jewish artisan guilds of Alexandria, who were renowned for their skills. Saul Lieberman argued that Pythagorean symbolism had an important influence on the temple cult. One example, according to Frederick Conybear, would have been the Therapeutae, a Jewish sect which existed in Alexandria. House of Comagen. Hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, but excuse me if I'm not. Here's a map showing the Kingdom of Armenia, the Parthian Empire, the Roman Empire. So an uh, area between the Black and Caspian and Mediterranean Seas. As I described in my uh, video about the origins of the Ashkenazic Jews, if you see uh, on the south southern part of the Black Sea here, there's a city called Trapezus. So around that area is where we described as the origin of the uh, Ashkenazic uh, ethnicity. This kind of conjunction of uh, roads on the Silk Road that was happening there. But anyway, I digress. Continuing. Franz Kumat proposed that the cult of the Magusians was ultimately responsible for the development of Mithraism, a type of proto-Freemasonry that was popular in the Roman army and which displayed remarkable similarities with Christianity. However, modern scholars dismiss the, this the, or the theory because they rightly perceive few genuine Zoroastrian influences in the cult, failing to realize that Kumant instead demonstrated that Mithraism was derived from a heretical Magian tradition. Roger Beck has submitted an intermediary theory, specifically, Beck located the transmission of the early Magian, tr Magian tradition to the Roman Empire via the House of Comagene, a small kingdom located in modern south-central Turkey. Hmm. In what had once been part of Greater Cappadocia, with its capital city as Samosata, or modern Samsat, near the Euphrates. Initially, the cult of the heretical Magi was most prevalent in that part of Asia Minor, that is, of Armenia, Cappadocia, and Pontus. Pontus was a name applied in ancient times to the extensive region in the northeast of Asia Minor, now Turkey, the greater part of which lay within the immense region of Cappadocia, which in early ages extended from the borders of Cilicia to the Black Sea. The Armenians traditionally identify themselves as descendants of Ashkenaz, the son of Magog. However, both Armenian and Georgian historians also record that after the destruction of the first temple, Nebuchadnezzar transported large numbers of Jewish captives not only to Babylon, but also to Armenia and the Caucasus. By the end of the 4th century BC, some Armenian cities had large Jewish populations. So again, guys, I would recommend you go look at my two videos on the studies done by Iran El Haik on the origins of Ashkenazic people and the location of ancient Ashkenaz. That'll fill in some information here. Kamajin, or Komajin, was ruled by a dynasty known as the Orontids, an Armenian dynasty founded by Orontes who had been appointed by the Persians as Satrap, or governor of Armenia between 570 B.C. to 560 B.C., the Orontids established their supremacy over Armenia around the, around the time of the Scythian and Median invasion in the 6th century B.C. Orontes married Rhodojun, the daughter of Arax Artaxerxes II, then reigning emperor of Persia. 
Artaxerxes II would have been the grandson of Xerxes, who, according to Jewish tradition, married Esther. In the book of Esther, Ahasuerus, usually identified with Xerxes, is married to Vashti, whom he puts aside after she rejects his offer to visit him during a feast. Ahasuerus, I think that's it, Ahasuerus's chief advisor, Haman, is offended by Esther's cousin, the guardian Mordecai, and gets permission from the king to have all the Jews in the kingdom killed. Esther foils the plan and wins permission from the king for the Jews to kill their enemies, and Mordecai becomes prime minister in Haman's place. This image is Esther before Ahasuerus by Tintoretto. In the late 19th century, some critics developed the theory that the Book of Esther was actually a story derived from Babylonian mythology, representing the triumph of the Babylonian deities Marduk and his goddess spouse Ishtar over the deities of Elam. Esther is an Aramaic name for the goddess Ishtar. Mordecai means servant of Marduk, Marduk being another name for Bel, the chief god of the Babylonians. In 1923, Dr. Jacob Hoshander wrote The Book of Esther in the Light of History, in which he proposed that the events of the book occurred during the reign of Artaxerxes II as part of a struggle between the adherents of the still monotheistic Zoroastrianism and those who wanted to bring back the Magian worship of Mithra and Anahita. The biblical story forms the core of the Jewish festival of Purim, which James Fraser believed was derived from the Babylonian New Year festival. Theodore Gaster also presents several theories for the origin of Purim in his volume, Festivals of the Jewish Year. In one theory, Purim is asserted to date back to the Babylonian New Year festival. On that day, the gods were believed to determine the fate of men by lot, and the Babylonian word for lot was Puru. The description in the book of Esther of the parade through the, the sorry of the parade through the streets dressed in royal robes, the mock combat, and other happenings are similar to the Babylonian celebration of the new year. According to Chaim Shaus, Purim originally appeared among the Persian Jews and was adopted by them from their non-Jewish neighbors. A very popular festival with both the Persian and Babylonian Jewry observed an annual festival that had the characteristics of a spring masquerade and was a festival of merriment, play, and pranks. Apparently, Jews also took part in this New Year celebration, and eventually the story of Esther had been invented to explain the celebration and to turn it into a Jewish celebration. Interesting. The rulers of Kamajin could claim dynastical ties with both Alexander the Great and the Persian kings. The combined heritage found in Antiochus I of Kamajin led to the assimilation of Mithras with the Greek Hercules, which marked the first early form of the Mithraic cult. Antiochus I of Commagene had supported Pompey against the Parthians, and in 64 BC was rewarded with additional territories. After submitting to Greek rule under the Seleucids, the Persian Empire eventually reemerged under the Parthians, a semi-nomadic people who, in the 2nd century BC, arose from an area southeast of the Caspian Sea. It was ruled by the Arsacids, who claimed descent from the Persian king Artaxerxes II. Through the conquests of Mithridates I and his brother Artabanus II in the 2nd century BC, the Parthians established control over Iran and expanded westward into Mesopotamia. Antiochus I was able to deflect Roman attacks from Mark Antony, whom he eventually joined in the Roman Civil War, but after Antony's defeat to Augustus, Commagene was made a Roman client state. This state of affairs signaled the beginning of the relationships that led to the transference of the Mithraic cult to Rome. 
So here we have an image, mountaintop, a tomb sanctuary on Mount Nemrut, built in 62 BC by King Antiochus I of Commagene of himself. Two lions, two eagles, and various Greek, Armenian, and Persian gods, such as Zeus uh, Aramazd, Aramazd, hmm. associated with Zoroastrian god Ahura Mazda, Hercules Vahan, Taishi Bakht, and Apollo Mir Mithras. <clears throat> Antiochus is most famous for founding the sanctuary of Nemrut Dagi, an enormous complex on a mountaintop featuring giant statues of the kings surrounded by gods, each god being a synthesis of Greek and Persian gods, where Apollo is equated with Mithras, Helios, and Hermes. The gods are flanked by the heraldic symbols of a lion and an eagle, Scholars dismiss the fact that this cult could represent an early form of Mithraism. However, Mithridates VI of Pontus, also known as Mithridates the Great, who ruled between 120 and 63 BC, was allied to the pirates of Cilicia, a province bordering Commagene. This image is Mithridates VI of Pontus, also known as Mithridates the Great, or Megas, and the Poison King. Mithridates, meaning Gift of Mithras, was one of Rome's most formidable and successful enemies, who engaged three of the prominent generals from the late Roman Republic in the Mithraditic Wars. Sulla, Lucullus, and Pompey. His demise is detailed in the play Mithridates of 1673 by Jean Racine, which formed the basis for many 18th century operas, include, including one of Freemason Mozart's earliest, known most commonly by its Italian name, Mithridate de Re di Ponto, written in 1770, when Mithridates the sixth was defeated by the Roman general Pompey the Great in 65 BC in the last of a series of three Mithridatic wars. Remnants of his army took refuge among the Cilician pirates. In the middle of the second century AD, the historian Appian adds that the pirates came to know of the mysteries from the troops who were left behind by the defeated army of Mithridates the sixth. Plutarch, who lived in the first century AD, maintained that these pirates were also responsible for transmitting the mysteries of Mithras to the Romans. According to Plutarch, these were the pirates who constituted such a threat to Rome until Pompey drove them from the seas. In his biography of, his, of this general, Plutarch writes of the pirates. They brought to Olympus in Lycia strange offerings and performed some secret mysteries, which still in the cult of Mithras first made known by them, the pirates. As a youth, after the assassination of his father, Mithridates V in 120 BC, Mithridates is said to have lived in the wilderness for seven years to build his resistance to hardship. While there, and after his accession, he cultivated an immunity to poisons by regularly ingesting them in low doses. He invented a complex universal antidote against poisoning, which Celsus in his De Medicina names Antidotum Mithridaticum, the basis of the English Mithrid Mithridate. Pliny the Elder described it as comprising 54 ingredients to be placed in a flask and matured for at least two months. After Mithridates' death in 63 BC, many Roman physicians claimed to have improved on the original formula, which they touted as Mithridatium. Mithridates' anti-poison routines included a religious component, where they were supervised by the Agari, a group of Scythian shamans who never left him. Mithridates was also reportedly guarded in his sleep by a horse, a bull, and a stag, 
who would whinny bellow and bleat whenever anyone approached his royal bed. Mithridates VI's daughter, Cleopatra of Pontus, married Tigranes II the, the Great, king of Armenia. The medieval Armenian historian Moses of Koran wrote that Tig Tigranes settled thousands of Jews from Syria and Mesopotamia in Armenian cities. It appears that some of these earliest Jewish settlers later converted to Christianity. Josephus wrote that Judean Jews were taken by Tigranes II's son, Atravazd II, and resettled in Armenia, again during the 1st century BC, but some years after Tigranes' resettlement. Many Jews stayed in the area. Vassal kings appointed there by the Romans included the Herodians Tigranes IV and Tigranes V in Greater Armenia and Aristobulus in the Western Borderland or Lesser Armenia. Mithraic Bloodline. This image is the Massacre of the Innocents by Peter Paul Rubens. <clears throat> The family of Herod were long-standing enemies of the emerging Christian movement. It was Herod the Great who was originally responsible for the massacre of the innocents. According to the book of Matthew, after the birth of Jesus, the wise men of the East, meaning Magi, visited Herod to inquire about the birth of the king of the Jews, because they had seen his star in the East, referring to their purported skill as astrologers. Herod became alarmed at the potential threat to his power and sent the Magi to search for the child in Bethlehem. However, after they found Jesus, the Magi were warned in a dream not to report back to Herod. When Herod realized he had been outwitted by the Magi, he ordered the slaughter of all boys under the age of two in Bethlehem and the surrounding area. But Joseph, as well, was also warned in a dream and had fled with Mary and Jesus to Egypt, where the family stayed until Herod's death before moving to Nazareth in Galilee. Here's an image. Salome's Dance, Dance of the Seven Veils by Andrea Marticio. Very nice. According to Mark, Salome, a daughter of Herodias, danced before her uncle, Herod Antipas, son of Herod the Great, and his successor at his birthday celebration, and in doing so gave her mother the opportunity to obtain the head of John the Baptist. Herodias was married to her cousin Herod II, the son of Herod the Great, who was born of Mariamne, the daughter of Simon the high priest. Although the New Testament accounts do not mention a name for the girl, this daughter of Herodias is often identified with Salome. Herod offered Salome a reward of her choice for performing a dance for his guests on his birthday. According to Mark's Gospel, Herodias bore a grudge against John for stating that Herod's marriage was her, to her was un unlawful persuaded her daughter to ask for John the Baptist's head on a platter. Against his better judgment, Herod reluctantly acceded to her request. Among those baptized by John was Jesus of Nazareth, who began his own ministry in Galilee, causing Herod Antipas, according to Matthew and Mark, to fear that John had been raised from the dead. According to Luke 13:31-33, a group of Pharisees warned Jesus that Antipas was plotting his death, whereupon Jesus denounced him as a fox and declared that he would not fall victim to such a plot because it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. The Gospel of Luke states that Jesus was first brought before Pontius Pilate for trial, since Pilate was the governor of Roman Judea. On learning that Jesus was a Galilean and therefore under Herod's jurisdiction, Pilate sent him to Antipas. Antipas was pleased to see Jesus, hoping to see him perform a miracle. But when Jesus remained silent in the face of questioning, 
Antipas mocked him and sent him back to Pilate. Luke says that these events improved relations between Pilate and Herod despite their earlier enmity. Enmity. Yeah, enmity. Augustus, who ruled the Roman Empire from 27 BC to 68 AD, was the first emperor of the Julio-Claudian dynasty, followed by Tiberius, Caligula, and Claudius until the last of the line, Nero. Augustus was a Julian through his adoption by his great uncle, Julius Caesar. The dynasty is so named because its members were drawn from the Julia and the Claudius family. Augustus commissioned the Roman poet Virgil to write the famous Latin epic, the Aeneid, the Aeneid which legitimized the Julio-Claudian dynasty as descendants of the founders, heroes, and gods of Rome and Troy. Modeled after Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, the Aeneid follows the Trojan refugee Aeneas, <laughs> uh, Aeneas as he struggles to f fulfill his destiny and reach Italy, where his descendants Romulus and Remus were to found the city of Rome. Following the typical dying god epics, Aeneas descends to the underworld, and there he speaks with the spirit of his father and is offered a prophetic vision of the destiny of Rome. Aeneas was the son of the prince Anchises, Anchises and the goddess Aphrodite. Aeneas' father was a first cousin of King Priam of Troy, both being grandsons of Ilus, founder of Troy. The Julia derived their name from Ilius or Ju Ju Julius, also known as Ascanius, the son of the Trojan hero Aeneas. The name Ascanius is also thought to have been derived from Ashkenazi or Ashguza, the name given to the Scythians by the ancient Akkadians. After the Trojan War, Ascanius escaped to Latium in Italy and had a role in the founding of Rome as the first king of Alba Longa. Caligula, an associate of Antiochus IV, the last king of Comagene, was influenced by the Babylonian or Mithraic tradition of worshipping the king as the embodiment of the sun god, a cult which he tried to institute in the Roman Empire. A plan to place a statue of himself as Zeus in the Holy of Holies of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem was halted only after the intervention of Caligula's personal friend, Herod Agrippa, the king of Judea. Herod Agrippa was the king named Herod in the Acts of the Apostles in the Bible. He was the grandson of Herod the Great, the son of Aristobulus IV and Berenice and brother of Herodias. The Acts of the Apostles, chapter 12, report that he persecuted the Jerusalem church, having James, son of Zebedee, killed and imprisoning Peter around the time of a Passover. Upon the assassination of Caligula in 41 AD, Agrippa's advice helped to secure the ascension of Emperor Claudius, who was the grandson of Mark Antony and Octavia, and who eventually made Herod Agrippa governor of Judea. In 54 AD, after the death of Claudius, he was succeeded by his great-nephew Nero, the last of the Julio-Claudian line. Here's an image depicting Nero, crowning Tiridates I of Armenia. <clears throat> after Claudius' death and during political strife within Armenia, the Parthian king Vologases I, the great-great-grandson of Antiochus I of Comagene, placed his own brother Tiridates I on the Armenian throne. This in invariably led to war, since it was Rome and not Parthia who held the right of Armenian secession. Over the next several years, Roman legions, led by the general Corbulo, invaded Armenia and the two powers fought a virtual stalemate. From 59 to 63 AD, the Romans installed Tigranes VI as king of Armenia. Tigranes was the son of Alexander, the grandson of Herod the Great. His mother was the great-granddaughter of Mark Antony and Antonia. But like his father and paternal uncle and his own son, Tigranes was an apostate to Judaism. Tigranes VI's son was Alexander of Cilicia, 
who married Eotape of Comagene, the daughter of Antiochus IV. By AD 63, however, a peace treaty was negotiated in which Tiridates would lay down his crown, hence surrendering the Parthian right to place him on the throne. But it was agreed that he would travel to Rome, where Nero himself would give him the throne under Roman authority. At the coronation, Tiridates declared that he had come in order to revere you, Nero, as Mithras. In the same visit, according to Pliny, Tiridates, the magus, brought magi with him and initiated him, Nero, into magical feasts or mystery rites. Along with the Comagene and Julio-Claudian dynasties, a third line would be introduced into this mix, which would feature in not only the creation of Mithraism, but also its incorporation into Christianity. That dynasty was the hereditary priest kings of Emesa, today Homs in Syria. Emesa was renowned for its Temple of the Sun, the place of worship of the god El Gebal, or El Ela Gabalas, a derivation of Baal, who was adored in the shape of a black stone. Herod Agrippa II, the son of Herod Agrippa, gave his sister Drusilla in marriage to Azizus, king of Emesa. She had previously been married to Epiphanes, the son of Antiochus I of Comagene. However, Herod had stipulated that Epiphanes should embrace the Jewish religion, but Epiphanes finally refused. Azizus, in order to obtain Drusilla's hand, consented to be circumcised. She later divorced him, though, in order to marry Antonius Felix, the procurator of Judea. Herod Agrippa II had an intimate friendship with the historian Josephus, having supplied him with information for his history, Antiquities of the Jews. Roger Beck attributes the formulation of the Mithraic cult to the father-in-law of Epiphanes, Tiberius Claudius Balbulus, a descendant of Antiochus I of Comagene and a court astrologer to the Roman emperors Claudius, Nero, and Vespasian. Balbulus had also been a prefect of Egypt and served as head of the museum and library of Alexandria. Balbulus accompanied Claudius on his expedition to Britain in 43 AD in a military capacity. When a comet had passed across the sky in either 60 or 64, signaling the death of a great personage, Balbulus tried to calm Nero's fears by noting that the usual solution was to murder predominant citizens, thus appeasing the gods. Nero agreed, killing many nobles. Balbulus, who had, Balbulus has two further namesakes among the Emesene priest kings of Elagabalus in Rome. Tiberius Julius Balbulus and his relative, Titus Julius Balbulus, who lived in the second half of the second century and the third century A.D. Here's an image depicting the Roman destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. by Francesco Hayes. The families of the Mithraic bloodline also contributed to the Roman attempt to suppress a Jewish revolt, which had culminated in the capture of Jerusalem. Under Roman occupation, though rebellion had been sporadic, disturbances among the Jews of Palestine were frequent. In 67 AD, the future emperor Vespasian and his son Titus arrived with the 15th Apollonian Legion, which had fought against the Parthians in Armenia and captured Galilee. Jerusalem fell in 70 AD, when according to Josephus, 97,000 Jews were taken captive. Jerusalem was destroyed, the temple itself was sacked, and the sacred contents of the Holy of Holies were carried back to Rome. Here's an image of Titus carrying off the treasures of the Temple of Jerusalem. <clears throat> the, 
the 15th Apollonian Legion, or Legio 15 Apollinaris, was originally formed by Julius Caesar in 53 BC, but was destroyed in Africa. It was again founded in 41 or 40 BC by Caesar's heir Octavian, or Augustus, who chose the name Apollinaris because he worshipped Apollo above all other gods. Following its campaign against the Jewish revolt, the Apollonian Legion then accompanied Titus to Alexandria, where they were joined by new recruits from Cappadocia. It seems to have been a curious mix of these several elements, and after the Legion had been transported to Germany, which erected their first temple dedicated to Mithras on the banks of the Danube. The Romans' allies in suppressing the Jewish revolt had also included not only Herod Agrippa and Antiochus VI of Comagene, but also Soahamus of Emesa, the brother to Gaius Julius Azizus, who was the first husband of the Herodian princess Drusilla. In addition, as noted by Roger Beck, Comagenean military elements under loyal command were also engaged in the suppression of the Jewish revolt, and they would have been in extensive contact with Roman legionary and other troops, including those units identified among the earlier carries of the new mystery cult, like the 15th Apollonian. Therefore, according to Beck, <coughs> the mysteries of Mithras were developed within a subset of these Comagenian soldiers and family retainers and were transmitted by them at various points of contact to their counterparts in the Roman world. Here's an image of Romans building the ramp at their, during their siege on Masada. <clears throat> According to Roman historian Cassius Dio, after the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, the worship overseen by the high priest ceased. The temple mount was covered over with rubble, and a pagan temple dedicated to Jupiter was built when Hadrian became Caesar. Hadrian installed two statues on the mount, one of Jupiter and another of himself. In addition, Hadrian expelled the Jews from Jerusalem altogether, only allowing them into the city on the fast of Tishabav, the ninth day of the lunar month of Av, a day of mourning for the destruction of the first and second Jewish temples. This appears to have caused a second Jewish revolt with the intent of recapturing Jerusalem and restoring the temple. In response, Rome sent six full legions with auxiliaries and elements from up to six additional legions, which finally managed to crush the revolt. According to Josephus, the siege of Masada, a large hilltop in current-day Israel by Roman troops from 73 to 74 AD at the end of the First Jewish-Roman War, ended in the mass suicide of the 960 Sicari rebels who were hiding there. St. Paul. And here's an image of St. Paul on the road to Damascus by Hans Speckert. Christianity was originally a Jewish reform movement, as Jesus himself affirmed in Matthew 5.17, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Christianity only became a new religion when it was transformed into a variation of the mystery cults by St. Paul. Paul came into conflict with Jesus' immediate followers, who were composed who composed the early church of Jerusalem. Also known as Nazarenes, they were headed by James, the brother of the Lord, and strictly followed the laws of Orthodox Judaism. Paul's rejection of Jewish law was mainly concerned with the requirement of circumcision. Robert Eisenman, a well-known expert on the Dead Sea Scrolls, speculates that in pushing forward this issue, Paul was acting in the service of the house of Herod, for whom circumcision was a particular impediment to expanding dynastic alliances with non-Jewish families. 
According to Eisenman, a series of events form part of several suspicious instances that seem to reinforce the point that Paul, originally named Saul, was an agent of the House of Herod. Eisenman also points out that there is a reference in Josephus to a member of the Herodian family named Saulus, which was not a common name in the period. This Saulus is not only the intermediary between the men of power, or the Herodians, the principal of the Pharisees, the chief priests, and all those desirous for peace, in other words, peace with the Romans, but Josephus also describes him as a kinsman of Agrippa. Likewise, in Romans 16.11, Paul writes, Greet Herodian, my kinsman. Sorry, that's greet Herodian, my kinsman. Maybe I said that. Okay. Bertil Gertner traces the parallels between the Masonic imagery of St. Paul's teaching and the Essene texts, noting that Paul likened himself to a skilled master builder who laid the foundations of the spiritual edifice. The Gospel of John features numerous Gnostic influences, and according to Timo Escola, in Messiah and the Throne, Jewish Merkaba Mysticism and Early Exaltation Discourse, Christian theology and discourse was also influenced by early Kabbalistic mysticism. Chaim Maccabi in The Mythmaker proposes that Paul synthesized Judaism, Gnosticism, and mysticism to create Christianity as a cosmic savior religion. Alan Siegel and Daniel Boyarin regard Paul's accounts of his conversion experience and his ascent to the heavens as the earliest first-person accounts of a Merkaba mystic in Jewish or Christian literature. In Paul the Convert, Siegel shows that Paul makes extensive use of the language of Merkaba, such as purporting that believers will be changed into Christ's likeness as believed by the Jewish mystics, for whom seeing the glory of God prepared the way for the transformation into his image. Valentinus, head of the Valentinians, chief among the early Gnostic sects, claimed that he received from Theudas, Theudas, a disciple of Paul, initiation into a secret doctrine of God, this secret wisdom which Paul taught to only a select few, revealed that God, the one whom most Christians ignorantly worship as creator, is in reality only the image of the true God. According to Valentinus, the Orthodox preachers mistakenly ascribe to God what actually applies only to the Demiurge. Whoever achieves this gnosis is ready to receive the secret sacrament called redemption, meaning release, or freedom from moral obligation. Elaine Pagels points out in The Gnostic Paul, Instead of repudiating Paul as their obstinate opponent, the Nicenes and the Valentinians re revere him as the one of the apostles who, above all others, was himself a Gnostic initiate. The Valentinians, in particular, allege that their secret tradition offers direct access to Paul's own teaching of wisdom and gnosis. According to Clement, they say that Valentinus was a hearer of Theudas, and Theudas, in turn, a disciple of Paul. Paul understood the resurrected Jesus as a mystical figure, the archetypal man, the original man or archetypal man formed before the human or earthly man is the true image of God, the beginning of creation and the Lord of it. Paul says, So it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living soul, the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man from heaven. The hidden wisdom of Paul is related to the secret mystery of Sophia, that is, to the passion, fall, and restoration of Sophia, the pattern for the passion, crucifixion, and resurre resurrection of Christ. 
However, we speak wisdom, or Sophia, among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the archons of this age that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before, in the presence of the aeons, divine beings dwelling with the Father in the Pleroma, unto glory, which none of the archons of this age knew, for they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Aeons has many meanings in Greek, including age, space, or a spiritual being governing a vast space or dimension either in the heavens, pleroma, or below. According to the Valentinian school of theology, which inherited its teaching from Paul, the aeon of this cosmos refers to a usurper god called the Demiurge, the evil creator god, the Bible's Yahweh. Valentinian theologians claimed that, according to Paul, Portions of the Mosaic Code and the Old Testament contained ordinances which derived from a usurper God and not from the highest God, whom they identified as the father of Jesus. Archon is the Greek word for ruler, and the power of the air is identified with the devil by Valentinians. The Archon was known in the 1st and 2nd century under many names, including Yaldaboath, Saklas, or Samael. Samael, that's another good black metal band. We've mentioned two really good bands in this episode. Uh, this image depicts the death of Simon Magus by an unknown artist, 1493. Very interesting. Suspiciously, after Paul was arrested in Jerusalem and rescued from a plot against his life, the local Roman Chiliarch transferred him to Caesarea, where he stood trial before Antonius Felix, the procurator of Judea, who was also closely associated with the Herodians. Felix had married Drusilla after she had divorced Azizus. Felix, who was reputed to be a very cruel and lustful man, was originally a slave, but was manumitted and promoted by Caesar and appointed governor of Judea in 52 AD, where he stayed in office until 58 AD. Felix had first been married to another Drusilla, the daughter of King Ptolemy of Mauritania, the grandson of Mark Antony and Cleopatra before the later Drusilla. In service to Felix, this Drusilla had been convinced to leave her husband by the notorious Simon Magus, who was a Samaritan sorcerer and a convert to Christianity considered the first of the Gnostics, baptized by Philip the Evangelist, whose later confrontation with Peter is recorded in Acts. This image is the Apostle Paul on trial by Nikolai Bodorevsky, 1875. Uh, Herod Agrippa II and his sister Berenice are both seated on thrones. Following an unsuccessful conspiracy among 40 Jews to assassinate Paul, the Romans hustled him away in the night, accompanied by 200 soldiers, to Felix in Caesarea. Before Felix, Paul was merely asked from which province he had come. Five days later, members of the Sanhedrin appeared and made charges, which Paul denied. Felix delayed the proceeding until further until Claudius Lysias, the captain of the Roman troops in Jerusalem, could come to give evidence. After a few days, Felix's wife, Drusilla, the Jewess, wanted to see and hear Paul. Paul appeared and gave the gospel to Felix and Drusilla. Felix trembled but was unrepentant. Felix and Drusilla would later on frequently send for Paul and talk with him. Felix wanted a bribe from Paul, so did not acquit him. Felix kept Paul a prisoner in Caesarea under loose house arrest for two years until the arrival of Festus, the new governor. Festus arranged for Paul to present his case to Herod Agrippa II and his sister Berenice, before whom Paul exercised his right as a Roman citizen to appeal unto Caesar. Finally, Paul and his companions sailed for Rome, where Paul was to stand trial for his, his alleged crimes. This image depicts the beheading of St. Paul by Enrique Simonet. Very 
good. Okay. And we'll wrap it up with this. Eisenman makes note that it is very unlikely that Paul could have made the miraculous escapes without the support of the Herodians and their Roman sponsors. As in, for example, the attack on Paul in the temple and his rescue by Roman soldiers witnessing these events from the fortress of Antonia. This episode, too, makes mention of a nephew and possibly a sister of Paul, resident in Jerusalem, but also presumably carrying Roman citizenship who warned him of a plot by zealots for the law to kill him. Without this kind of intervention, Paul could have never enjoyed the protection he does in Caesarea and retired to Rome in such security. According to several church fathers and apocryphal books, Paul was beheaded in Rome by orders of Nero. All right, so that'll close out this video. I will continue with the second half of this uh, section. We are reading part four of book one of Ordo Ab Keo by David Livingstone. We're reading book, part four of the book of Revelation, which we will finish uh, in the next video, uh, continuing with the section Mithraism. So I thank you all for watching, and I'll see you real soon in the next one.